Going to the park is fun. Maybe you're there to get some exercise. Maybe you want some fresh air for a change. No matter your reason, if you're at the park, you may be at the most dangerous part of town. From every bush, around every corner, someone could be watching and waiting, someone who wants to change your life for the worst, or put an end to it for good. Enjoy these 10 allegedly true scary stories about public parks. If you want to be in a future video, you can send me your stories at darknessprevails.org. I'm looking for Pizza Hut, Ravenmocker, and teacher confession stories. Thank you. Number 1. The Stranger at the Playground by Michaela This happened some time ago, so some of my memories may be a little fuzzy. As a child, around the age of seven, I had a very good friend named Jackie. Jackie's family was great to me and very generous. Because my parents were often busy with work, they would almost always take me with them to a local playground. Almost every time I went, it was normal and a lot of fun. We'd go and play for hours, making memories, and then painfully leave, making me look forward to the next time we could go. But one of these occasions, as Jackie and I were walking over to the swing sets, Jackie suddenly tapped on my shoulder and said, Hey, Michaela, do you see that man? He, he keeps staring at you. I glanced over to where she was pointing, and I noticed the man. He didn't look very sketchy. He looked like a normal guy. And in my child's brain, he didn't really scare me as much as he should have. But after seeing him look at me for so long, I decided that I should say something and request to go home early. The next day, we went to the park again, and the same man was there. Jackie assumed he was harmless, as he was just watching, never really moving. But I continued to take glances at him. But, to my horror, at one point we made eye contact. I should have known that was inevitable, but it was still startling. Especially as, after we made eye contact, he slowly stood up, and instead of walking, he basically stumbled over to us in my direction. Luckily, Jackie's parents caught sight of this. They looked up and noticed the man, and nervously rushed over afraid of what he was trying to do. They grabbed onto my hand, but before they could move me away, the man himself grabbed onto my shoulder and started yanking me hard, nearly pulling my arm out of socket. He was trying to take me away. He was saying slurs and speaking curse words, in between phrases like, I'm taking her, she's mine, custody, by now, bystanders with their children were glancing over at the incident, shocked and horrified. An onlooker eventually was fighting off the guy to protect us, as if he was high on some sort of substance or drunk. He basically crawled away into the nearby woods. I never figured out why he was saying such things. He wasn't related to me at all, and none of my friends or family knew him. But that was the last time we saw him at the park. Number two, A Nice Walk by Cassie B. This is easily the creepiest thing that ever happened to me. It happened a week ago as I'm writing this, and I thought I'd share it with you all. I was with my friends, Rachel, Max, and Jake. I was over at Jake's house with him and his sister, because my parents were gone and I did not like staying at my house alone. At the time, their parents were out somewhere as well. I can't remember exactly what they were doing. But we were bored when Rachel offered to drive us to the park. We accepted as we had nothing better to do. We packed up and left the house. Now, that day was fairly warm, as California is most of the time, and it was summertime. It was about 9 p.m., and usually people were everywhere outside, but that night was oddly quiet, and there was no one at the nearby park. Now, I couldn't help but feel creeped out by this fact, 
As you can probably tell, it scares me when I'm alone or there's no one around. Anyway, this wasn't aided by the fact that some of the lights on the sidewalk were broken and it was black in some spots. They should uh, really get those fixed, Rachel said to Max, who simply nodded. Maybe we should just go back home, guys, Jake offered, standing just in front of me, and I nodded in agreement. Maybe he was right. Maybe everyone was gone for a reason. But Max just scoffed, calling us cowards, and we kept on walking. As much as I wanted to punch him in a friendly way, I knew he was just joking. We were walking in a line, Max, Rachel, me, then Jake, in that order. I looked over to Jake, the only one that seemed to understand the creepy vibe of the park that night, and I said to him, what do you think's going on tonight? I know, right? He agreed. It's usually packed here. I wonder what happened. I shrugged and noticed that Rachel and Max were now gone. Jake did too. We didn't even notice as we were talking. Fantastic, Jake said. They're gonna try to prank us, aren't they? Jake said, exasperated, and looked around. I replied, let's just head back to your place without them. They'll be fine, and it'll teach them a lesson. Jake shook his head. I don't have the keys. Rachel does. I sighed. Great. Maybe a window is open at the house. You want to walk there? He replied. Well, that'd be a waste because the windows are locked. Better than being here, I said. Fine, let's go, he said. We walked halfway down the street, passing the broken lights of the park, when he suddenly stopped. I tried to keep walking, but he pulled me back. What's wrong, I asked, looking forward. He seemed scared. He was looking up at one of the lights that was still on. Then he looked over at a nearby house and pointed. That's where one of our teachers lives, Mr. Parchment. How about we just go over there, see if he's home and wants some company? Uh, okay, I replied. We walked across the street and knocked on the door, but no one answered. His car was in the driveway and the lights in his kitchen were on as well. I called out, Mr. Parchment! But again, no answer. Maybe he's out for a walk too, Jake said. I was feeling more uneasy by the minute. Then I nudged Jake to look back at the park. Another one of the sidewalk lights was beginning to dim, and then it suddenly just popped with an audible sound, and it went out. It was probably nothing. Maybe it shorted out or something. But us being so creeped out already, we started running. His house was a couple of minutes drive away, so the run was maybe five or six minutes. We were winded when we arrived. Even though Jake said the door was locked, he ran up to it and tried to open it. But at that same time, Rachel and Max pulled up in the vehicle. They ran up to the door, got Jake out of the way, and unlocked it, and they rushed inside as well. They seemed to be in a bigger hurry than we were. They were pale, and their eyes were wide. It was strange. At first, we tried to get some information out of them, but instead, they ignored us and turned on the TV, trying to pretend things were normal. A few minutes later, I looked out the window facing toward the park area, and in the distance, every single one of the lights that had been off were on now, and there were people all over. Joggers, dog walkers, people playing Pokemon Go. The park was completely active and brightly lit, the opposite of what we had just seen and experienced. What in the world just happened? I asked, looking at Jake, who shrugged, then looked over at Rachel and Max, who were completely quiet still. All I was able to get out of those two is that they never wanted to go back to that park. I know you may be thinking they were just pranking us like we thought, but I changed my mind about this. When I caught them both at separate times when we were over at Rachel's house, looking out the window, nervously looking out at the park in the distance. I don't know what happened that night, or if anything happened at all, but it was terrifying and confusing. This isn't your typical story, but I hope you enjoyed. Number three, 
Girl on the Bench by Amy. I'm a college student, and I enjoy the college I go to. Right in front of it, there's a huge park, perfect for students to study in the fresh air, so it usually has about 10 people scattered about. On my way to college one morning, I decided to take a longer route of walking through the park, as I had woke up extra early, and that day was a particularly beautiful day. As I was walking, I looked over to my left, only to see a gorgeous girl sitting alone on a bench, reading a book. I assumed she was studying. She had a dated, 2000s kind of style, which made her stand out from the usual people I saw here, and I immediately found it very charming. I assumed she was also a student at the same college. Suddenly, she glanced up from her book and caught me staring at her. She smirked, and I immediately looked away, embarrassed. I could feel my cheeks turn a bright shade of red. The next day, I decided to take the long route again, because it was another nice day, and I secretly hoped to see the girl again a second time. As I walked past the same bench, I saw her sitting there again, reading her book. I took out a book from my bag and sat down on the grass at a reasonable length away from her. She looked at me, giving me a small smile and a little wave. I smiled back and I felt my heart skip a beat. I wanted to go up to her and start a conversation. I had even played it all out in my head the night before but I was just too nervous, so I sat there pretending to read my book until I realized it was almost time to go to class. After that, a week passed since I saw the girl again. The weather controls my routes to school every day, and it had been pretty rainy lately, so I had to walk the faster and shorter route. I was walking that short route when a man stopped me and told me, I would have to go around the long way again, due to some construction that was going on that day. I was pretty annoyed. I'd have to walk further in the rain, and I had no form of protection against the elements. I wasn't wasting the little money I had on an umbrella. I was a college student, after all. After I went on my way, to my surprise, I saw the girl again. She was sitting on the bench, reading her book. She was drenched and not even wearing a coat. She looked up and smiled at me. A full smile, showing gorgeous teeth and squinted eyes. I was slightly freaked out, as we were the only ones there, and this girl was giving me weird vibes now. Why was she out in the rain? Why did she have her book out, exposed to the water? I avoided eye contact and continued on my way to the college. I told myself it was finally time to confront this girl on the bench. I got up very early one morning and I made my way to the park. I was honestly pretty nervous about this. I was thinking of how I was supposed to introduce myself and what I was going to say. Before I knew it, I was already there. She was where I expected her to be, sitting on the bench reading her book. As I looked around, I noticed no one else in the park, except for a group of three people sitting further away. I also noticed that there were no other benches in the park. I never realized that until now. She was sitting alone on the only bench in the entire park, and she looked more beautiful than ever. I took a deep breath, and I began to approach the girl. I looked down at my feet as I walked to avoid awkward eye contact as I got closer to her. Out of the corner of my eye, I could now see the leg of the bench as I approached it. As I looked up to face her again, she was gone. I was startled. How had I not noticed that she left? I hadn't heard a sound. I was left in confusion, and I found myself drawn to the shiny plaque that had been on the center of the bench where she was just sitting. It read, Katie Clark, a great friend to all, 
1980 through 2001. I quickly and nervously made my way out of the park. Number four, Women Can Be Creeps Too, by Brooke. Let me just preface this by saying I was around five or six years old when this happened. I was an extremely friendly child, naive, with a deep love for animals, of course. These were both horrible traits for me to have in the situation I was in. Anyway, back then I loved going to the park and my father took me to one nearby one day. He did as he usually did and took me to the swing sets. He got me started on one and walked to a nearby bench to talk on the phone. I was still visible from where he was, so I felt safe. Not a thought of any danger crossed my mind. I was happily doing my own thing on the swing set when my young eyes caught the glimpse of a puppy. It was a young St. Bernard puppy, which was my favorite breed. I instantly got excited and the person walking it seemed normal enough. She was a middle-aged woman. I'd been schooled on stranger danger, but they always taught us about men, showed men in the examples and in the stories, so I had absolutely no qualms about going up to a strange woman, because thanks to society, women could not be bad strangers. I thought it was fine, so I hopped off of the swings, and I ran over to her. I was excited as ever as I ran over and asked if I could play with her cute puppy. Looking back on it, there were plenty of things that should have been red flags. The way she seemed nervous, the way she smiled as I approached before looking around in every direction. She called me cute and was very touchy with me. She brushed my hair with her hands, touched my shoulders up and down, she even placed her hand on my thigh, claiming to be feeling my pretty flowered dress because it looked so soft. A lot of my mother's friends at the time said similar things to me, though not as creepily, so I didn't really notice. I was rambling on and on about how much I loved dogs and animals in general. I was an extremely talkative child to the point where my own talking would distract me. She simply smiled at me, but that made me feel uncomfortable at long last. It reminded me of a storybook I had read to me where a picture showed the big bad wolf smiling down at Little Red when he was posing as her grandmother. The woman told me, he's one puppy out of a litter of five. You can always come over to see the other puppies if you like. They're over there with my friend. She nodded in the direction of a wooded area by the park. It was close by, and my child's brain was telling me that she had brought one puppy, so there was no way she'd be lying about more puppies. But of course, this was ignorance. I went with her without a second thought, we walked for a couple of minutes over to the other side of the park. She led me up the hill, and I looked around. All I could see was a group of teenagers playing frisbee, and an older man sat alone on a bench a few yards away from them. I didn't see any puppies, and I got nervous when the man got up and started walking towards us. I didn't know what to do, and I did the only thing that came to mind. I screamed as loudly as I possibly could, and soon tears were falling from my eyes. I don't remember much after that, just that two of the teenage boys ran over and began interrogating the woman and the older man, asking if they were my parents. The two of them tried to lie and say yes, but I remember shaking my head profusely. I remember the boy best by his hair. He had colored it green. He was pulling me away from the pair and I remember a lot of yelling. He asked where my real parents were and had me show him to them. So I led him to my dad who was freaking out and yelling at me when I got there. I don't know exactly what happened to them, that creepy couple at the park. 
but I do hope we never meet again. And number five, I was followed into the woods by Bird Lady. As children, we are taught to listen to adults, whether it be our parents or guardians, relatives or teachers. We're always told that we need to trust these people. However, not every family friend you meet can be trusted. Not every adult is worthy of that. I am a girl, and I was six years old when this happened. When I was little, I always went to work with my dad on Sundays, mostly because I was bored at home. All there was to do there was listen to my mother's sewing machine, but the whirring sound it made was irritating. That's what I usually did on Sundays, hearing the so, so, so sounds. Another reason was because behind my father's work, there was this wide expanse of forest, trees for miles and miles. Now, I lived in a town where nothing really ever went sour. Everyone sort of knew everyone, and people let their kids play outside after four by themselves. It was quiet, peaceful, and I enjoyed it as a kid. I mean, I still do now, but I'm much more cautious than I was a long time ago. That particular Sunday really didn't seem off, until I asked my father if I could go back into the trails in the woods. You see, there was this paintball park right next to my father's workplace, and all these long park trails were being built so that when the park was opened and everything was finished up, players could go back into the woods to do some practice with the paintballs. However, since they were closed on Sunday, my father let me go back there. Honestly, I sort of wish he hadn't. Like I mentioned earlier, I was only six years old at the time. So little me was skipping down the trails, landing in puddles where it had rained the night before. I never went too far, as I knew where to stop when it started getting a little too dark under the canopy of tall tree leaves. I was passing a small clearing to the right side where there was a log when I noticed I was hearing footsteps coming from behind me. Turning around, since I was a curious child, I saw it was one of my father's friend's brothers. Now, what I did not know was that the man that stood behind me was very messed up in the head. I went from staring at him in confusion to greeting him politely. His name was Bob. Hey, Bob, why are you back here? Did you want to look at the trees too? I asked him, still a little unsure. He shook his head and walked ahead of me, sitting against this fallen over log in the clearing. Bob then turned to me and asked me, it must have been a long walk. Would you like to sit on something? His face had a small grin growing on it. Now, as a child, I was very, very innocent. Back then, I thought magic existed, and so I thought he was talking about a chair or fold-out thing that he had brought along or something. So, being the naive child I was, I asked him, What do you mean? He looked down to his jeans that he was wearing. Then he looked back at me, motioning me to come sit in his lap. Even as a child, I knew something was terribly wrong here. Oh, no thank you, I said, quite weirded out. I then began walking quickly the other way back to my dad's work. He shouted behind me, Come back here! And before I knew it, I was being chased by this man. Luckily for me, Bob was quite overweight. I ran like a bat straight out of the underworld, away from him, as he jogged about 20 or so feet behind me. I remember turning back and seeing one of those Swiss Army pocket knives. He had the blade part unsheathed as he raced toward me. I made it to the tree line behind my dad's work, and he wasn't up there. When I stopped, he was nowhere behind me. 
I think he'd given up by that point. My dad wasn't there either. He was apparently at the paintball trail entrance, thinking that that was the way it led out. Instead of meeting me, he met up with Bob first. He then asked Bob what he was doing, but my father told me he said nothing. I only remember the story recently, and I've told both my parents the entire thing. My father pointed out that he also always went into the room where I'd watched some cartoons, and he would lay on the bed with me in strange, inappropriate positions. Not only that, but he would always touch my cousin's arms whenever they were around. We haven't seen Bob in a while, but maybe that's for his own good. Be careful who you trust with your children. Parks often make great escapes, but if you're not careful, you might need to make a great escape from the park. Putting yourself out in the public, in a place where most people are busy, doing their own things, if there are even other people around, you might just make an easy target. A target for people who crave children. A target for extremely hungry animals. A target for the supernatural world you refuse to believe in, despite the many, many stories you've heard. So, go ahead. Enjoy your walk through the park while you still have a pulse enough to enjoy it. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget, you can always send me any of your scary stories at darknessprevails.org. But we are always looking for certain topics if you have that. Specifically, sightings of the Native American Ravenmocker, a bird-like spirit that stills people's hearts. Not in the romantic way, either. Confessions from teachers about the scariest things you've experienced. And stories from Pizza Hut workers. If you've got any of those stories, remember, just go to darknessprevails.org. Thank you. Now, if you want to support my channel further, you can go to Google Play and download my free app, Spooked. If you do have a little extra cash, you can click the shop button below or go to morbidmonsters.com to buy my creepy merch. Or go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails and donate any amount and you'll get your name in the credits at the end of these videos. Now then, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about five horrifying back to school stories. Ashley Monroe says, that moment when school starts tomorrow. Well, Ashley, rest in peace. You will be missed. Unlike school, because school sucked. Maggot Bam Bam 100 says, I love your videos so much, but school will take me away. Edit, I've been watching your videos for about two years now. Fantastic, you're a longtime fan. That's always good to hear, but what's not good to hear is that school is getting in the way of my viewership. Hmm. Maybe I should start my own school, where all you do is watch my videos. Ah, but then I'd have to feed you. Amar Original says, Thanks for reminding me of the daily torture routine we have to endure, Poppy. Daily torture? You mean life? You mean working for YouTube? You mean getting sick before going on a vacation and then coming back and getting sick again? Ah, don't you love it. Thorn says, when you don't have to go to school, but now you're stuck with the burden of being an adult with college loans. Ooh, I'll do you one better. And that face when you dropped out of college for your pre-law degree and now you do YouTube. True story. And Adriana Sanchez says, you know what's horrifying? Having my ex in my class. When I read that, I don't know why, but I imagined your ex being one of the students and you being the teacher, and I thought, whoa. That's a story in the making. Anyway, thank you all so much for tuning in to another Darkness Prevails video. More longer ones are coming soon, as soon as I stop getting awful stories from some people who feel the need to submit troll submissions. Here are my credits to the patrons who continue to support my channel and what I do. Thank you to all these amazing folks. Until next time, remember, this world is a strange one, so stay safe out there 
and stay creepy.